Today's readings are from Hebrews chapters 11 and 12. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father, because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for joy set before him, did endured the cross, scorning its shame, and, and who sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that we can worship you, even though we cannot be together, that we uh, can use this medium to be able to really feel part of your church. And so we thank you for being with us today and we thank you for your word. Oh Lord, we just pray for Ian and Joe dear, as they speak this morning. We pray for your Holy Spirit to anoint them and to give them this message that you have for us all. And we pray that their spirits will be lifted up as they pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so now back to Jodie and Ian. Good morning. Um, thank you to David and Frida for that reading and for the prayer too. Uh, welcome. This morning is, is slightly different. Um, Ian and I are sat on stools. Uh, we thought because there was a boy band that the stools needed to appear. Um, they wouldn't take them, so we thought we would. Um, but this morning, uh, we're going to have a conversation because this week we're starting our new series, Running with the Giants. Now, it's a series we've done for several summers uh, where we take the opportunity to look at heroes of the faith, uh, people in scripture. And also last year, we 
we did some people who just lived and have inspired our faith. Uh, to look at how they cheer us on, you know, therefore we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. So they're cheering us on in our race of life and our race of faith and they're, they're encouraging us. And this year particularly, we, we're looking at heroes and, and giants of the faith who have really come out of hardship and there's been fruit out of, those, out of that hardship. And we recognise 2020 has been really tough so far. We're only in July, um, but it's been a really hard season. And so we want to look at, at people in the Bible, giants of the faith, heroes who can encourage us and spur us on to say, even in these tough times, even out of hardship, even out of pain, fruit can come, fruit that is significant and eternal and kingdom. And so we're going to be spending the next several weeks looking at that, at different aspects of how we can be supernaturally fruitful in this season. Um, but today we're going to have a conversation about it. And so Ian and I are here and we're going to be chatting a, a few questions through. And so we invite you into that conversation and jump on the chat and join us. Um, but I'm going to start by asking you, Ian, Ian, who are some of your heroes of the faith, some giants, people you admire in God? I think there's two people really that I would put um, above everyone else. Um, one's Jackie Pullinger. Jackie was actually meant to be here this weekend, um, but we've rescheduled that. So she's gonna come hopefully next year. Um, she's not able to travel obviously because of the current situation, partly in Hong Kong and partly because of the COVID. Um, but Jackie Pullinger, and I would encourage anyone that hasn't read Chasing the Dragon to read the book. And I think what I love about Jackie is that, um, well, a number of things really, one, she has a, a, a ruthless commitment that we have to serve the poor and the broken. And that if we serve the poor and the broken, we touch something of the precious heart of God. Mm -hmm. Second thing that I love about her is she's absolutely 120% sold out for Jesus. There's no compromise. And when we were there in January, she was saying as, a, as an organization, they have no reserves. They have no strategy. They just simply do whatever the Holy Spirit tells them to do. And God's provided for them for over 50 years. And I think such a shining example of the simplicity of following Jesus just blows me away. And my other one is Martin Luther King. I was, uh, I was really sad this week, actually, to hear of the death of John Lewis, because he's one of my heroes as well. I've loved the American civil rights movement from the 60s. I've loved reading about it. And I think what gets me about Martin Luther King is he had a dream from God about a humanity where everyone was valued and everyone was included and everyone had dignity and worth. And he saw the potential to mobilize the church to bring change. And if anyone wants to read it, start with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, because the church mobilized for over a year mm. to help people not to use the buses, to force integration on the buses. And it's a wonderful example of someone vision casting and the church getting it and really, really recognizing they can bring a change. And I love it and I celebrate it. I love the fact that I get to carry the same name. Um, I'm still working on some of the aspects, um, but for me, he's just an amazing hero in terms of what God can do through someone who's ready and available and willing to stand up in the power of the Holy Spirit. So for me, it's Jackie Pullinger and Martin Luther King. I'm sure you've got your own heroes, Jodie. So who would you say are your heroes of the faith? Um, so for me, I think people are admiring God, um, particularly, I think for, for me personally, I think Priscilla Shira, um, who's a, a Bible teacher. I think I admire her and I look to her in faith because she just teaches the Bible in such inc with incredible depth and incredible grace. And she's an incredible communicator. And I look to her and I think, wow, <laughs> give me some of that. And I think that's partly we admire, don't we? People we want to be like. Um, and then I've actually got heroes who I know um, so friends and family who just I see are giants in faith and um, one some of you you know and some others know as well but Melissa Whitcomb um, is probably one of my heroes um, <laughs> unsurprisingly I'm crying but the way she's so steadfast in her faith and she perseveres through trials in with such grace mm. um, and just the faithfulness she has to and commitment she has to God and to his mission and to people and the way um, she offers hospitality to people um, is just heroic <laughs> and so for me Melissa is one of my heroes one of my giants of the faith and um, some other friends as well my friend Miriam 
She's um, young, like Melissa, she's younger than me, but I think it's good to have giants who are younger than you, um, keeps you striving as well. And uh, Miriam just has such a zest for life, a bit like Jackie, 120%. And she, passionate for the kingdom, uh, passionate about Jesus and knowing him, but also other people coming to know Jesus and is so willing um, and obedient, <laughs> not just but obedient to say yes to God when he's asking her to do something that means others will get to know him and I just find that it's so inspiring. Um, a family friend Doug who's um, in his oh, 80s I think oh 70s am I doing you a disservice Doug sorry um, he's, <laughs> but just his faithfulness again and um, that seems to be a theme for me um, just the faithfulness I guess we're looking at heroes of the faith so it fits but just over the years and, and the, the tough things he lost his wife just a couple of years ago and just to see how his He's emerged from that and, and journeyed through that in through the pain and the hurt of that um, and still preaching, still ministering, still introducing people to Jesus is just great. Um, so yeah, there are a few of my, my heroes. Um, and actually, you'll hate this, but you as well is one of, one, of my, one of my giants. I know you'd hate that. But the way you lead, I think, because you, you lead wholeheartedly. Um, and I think that's, there's not, it's so honest the way you lead. Um, there's no smoke and mirrors, there's, there's no um, performance in the way that you lead. And, and so to see someone lead honestly and, and openly and with transparency and vulnerability, I don't think we come across that very often. And so um, I aspire to, to lead like you and to wholeheartedly serve um, no matter what. Yeah. I kind of feel like I need to say this isn't a rehearsed conversation no. <laughs> and Jodie's not paid to say that. <laughs> Although she's first in line now for a wage increase, obviously, out of that. So well done, Jodie. Um, and I've always been struck, actually, that I, I think um, I heard someone speak a long time ago about two ways of finding out what you're called to. And, and I found them as really, really helpful. One is what really winds you up, what really frustrates you, because often what we get frustrated about is actually what is really important to us and what we really value the highest. And so normally in church life or in everyday life, the things that really, really wind us up if nobody's doing them is often a sign of the things that we're called to, which is why we value it so much. And the other thing is who we admire and who we see as our heroes, because often the people that we see as heroes and the people that, that our hearts really respond to, we respond to them because they carry something that we aspire to carry. I was really interested what you said about Priscilla Shira, because you're an excellent communicator and you've got a heart for biblical truth. And actually she's a great example of that. And I think if you take a moment to stop and analyze who you particularly aspire to be like and who your heroes are, I think you can find out a lot about yourself and something I'd encourage you, we've got our iPads here this morning, so um, you're able to join in the discussion. But actually, it might be good if you want to, to put on the live stream who your heroes are and why you uh, admire them in the way that you do. And I think it can help us understand who, some, of, some of how God's wired us and some of the things that he's called us to as well. So I found that a really useful tip. Yeah. Yeah, we're interested to see what everyone comes up with. And uh, I think there'll be biblical heroes and historical heroes and uh, local heroes as well. So it'll be exciting to see that. Um, the thing about heroes is we often talk about kind of that hero moment. So they're remembered for the glory moment, the success moment, the moment they overcame or they won the battle. You know, every, every story I think is, is based around, around the hero story, isn't it? So someone um, rising through and overcoming and we rarely talk about when we're talking about our heroes, the, the tough times that they went through and the hardships and the challenges they faced, um, which is interesting because it's, it's most likely in those moments that the fruit was forged, that that was, that was the moment in those tough times where out of that mess came the beauty of it and came the hero and the overcoming moment. And, and so as we think about this season and the challenges in it, but more generally as, as one of my heroes, <laughs> what, are, what are some of the hardest, what's one of the hardest things you've had to face that you recognise um, has helped be you become who you are today? I think it's a really good question because I, I think you're right, Jodie, that heroes are formed in the crisis mm -hmm. normally, and it's what God invests in the crisis times that actually then becomes the foundation for being able to bear fruit. And often we want the fruit, but we don't want the crisis. And I think, I think for Chris and I, when we, um, I used to lead a church in South London 
led a church in a place called Downham for 12 years. Um, and I loved the community. I used to pray, walk around it, used to um, do lots of, of reaching out to people and stuff. Um, Chris and I got married um, and we ended up, um, wasn't planned, but we ended up having to take on leading the congregation a month after we got married. Not great um, <laughs> plan, really. Um, and we had some amazing people, but massive need and not a lot of people able to carry that need. And so um, we had to sacrifice incredibly to try and serve the people. So we, we learned lots. It was, it was fun, crazy, adventurous, um, but it was challenging. And um, we weren't the earliest, we weren't the youngest people getting married. Um, and uh, we wanted to have kids. And in the middle of that, we were trying for a family. And we took over two years to conceive the first time. And then um, we had a miscarriage. And then we took over two years to conceive a second time. Um, and then we had a second miscarriage. And we had all of this um, demand on us and inside incredible pain and didn't know how to handle that. And then our church leaders at the time, our kind of movement leaders, um, came and visited us and said, we think we need to move you from this setting. And there was a local hillside and I used to go and stand on it and look over all the houses and pray for the kingdom of God to come. And I would stand on the hillside and say, God, if I need to lay down my life to see the kingdom of God come here, God, I'm willing to do that. And I had all these dreams and hopes and uh, uh, promises over what God was going to do. And I ended up being removed from being able to do any of them, plus carrying our own inner pain. Um, and that was really challenging when you've got hopes, dreams, things you've carried, things you've prayed into, and you're not going to see the answer of it. And um, it was amazing how God worked because it was out of that actually that we ended up moving up to Loughton, um, which has been incredibly fruitful. And within three months, Chris conceived again. She bled during the pregnancy, but Emma's an overcomer, as you will have seen. So she made it through. She's and great then, this morning. Yeah, she did really well. Proud, proud dad moment. Um, and, and then Abby came on quickly afterwards. Um, but about two years after we um, had got to Loughton, um, there was a moment in a meeting where we had a visiting sp speaker and he asked us to come forward and surrender everything to Jesus again, which is always a good thing to do. And I stood there before God and I was kind of like, well, I've surrendered everything to you. I wouldn't have got here without surrendering. But God, I surrender everything to you again. And in those moments, God just spoke to me. I felt God speak to me and say, but have you given your heart? And I realised that I'd lost something in the having the having to move and the having to let go. And I realized that what I do, and I think many of us do in times of challenge, is out of our pain, we retreat in our hearts. And I'd come here and I was preaching, I was leading, and, and I think, you know, other people might disagree, I think I was doing a good job, um, but I realized that I was doing all the right things, but I'd lost something in my heart. And in those moments, I had to make a choice God was inviting me to make a choice, to say, are you willing to let your heart out again? Are you willing to embrace this community in your heart in the way you had before? And I did, and through that, God has brought me to healing. But I think, I think we learned so much. But if I'm honest, it was really, really tough. Yeah. Now, I know this season, is, for many people, has been tough, and maybe one of the toughest seasons um, that they've ever been through. I know you've not always had it easy either. Mm -hmm. And we need to say happy birthday to Jodie, because she was 40, if I dare say that, um, on Wednesday. So you've had a significant mm -hmm. birthday. Yeah. You're a single person. I have no idea how you're still single, Jodie, oh. and why nobody snapped you up. I have no idea. Thanks, um, how have you found this season? And how have you managed to cope? What's been the what's been the ups and downs of this season? I think, I mean, it's such an interesting season, isn't it? And there's so many challenges for for so many different people, and we've all got our own stories to tell. And there's and there's been challenges for people on health. Uh, there's been challenges for people on emotional well-being and mental well-being. There are financial challenges, and, and none of those challenges are disappearing anytime soon. Um, and I just think the intensity of it and the re just the relentlessness of it um, has taken its toll. And I know for me, one of the hardest things, um, certainly 
in the first few months was the lack of physical connection. Um, so for that to be cut off literally overnight um, for a prolonged amount of time, uh, for someone whose love language is physical touch or one of them, um, that, you know, whether it's a hug from a friend, a hello, goodbye, whether it's a squeeze on the shoulder from someone as they're passing or a punch on the arm from a friend or, or snuggles with the, the nieces and nephews, um, to suddenly be without physical connection and physical touch uh, was really hard for me. Um, and, you know, God was really gracious and I, I don't, I, I got through it fine. And, but I know for people who were shielding as well and, you know, that a similar situation, it can feel so isolating. And for those shielding in families, I, I can't imagine the torture of that, of being actually in the same house as other people. You know, I didn't have anyone around, so it was, just wasn't an option. Whereas for some people, being in the same house but not being able to be in the same room as loved ones, and that just torturous. Um, I can't think of another word for it. And, and so it's been, that was a real challenge for me, I think, in the beginning, the, just the, the lack of physical, physical touch. Um, I think working from home has been, uh, for such an extended amount of time, has been really hard. Um, no, I've stopped calling that. it, yeah, <laughs> I've stopped calling it working from home and calling it living at work. Um, just the same four walls, the same computer screen. Uh, the same meeting. I can't remember what was said in, in which meeting because they've all blended into one, you know? And I think it's, it's something about feeling trapped and, and adds to the isolation factor as well, I think. Um, I think that's been really hard, that, that sense of, of isolation for, for many of us, but that's something I battled against, I think, um, and really had to lean into God for um, and to, to seek his comfort, seek his friendship um, in a way maybe I haven't before um, and I just think the tiredness um, I think this season's been really tiring I think it's been emotionally exhausting I think it's been mentally exhausting um, I think people's resilience has been really low um, being able to deal with um, think kick back on things has just been harder because we don't have the the resilience we've had and that's been a real challenge. And then to add into that, when we're feeling our most fatigued and our most tired, uh, George Floyd was murdered. And I think that's probably one of the most significant moments of our generation that's happening right now, the, the murder of George Floyd, and then the pain and the emotion uh, that ca has come out from that, and the subsequent conversations around race and racism is a huge challenge um, when we're all feeling so depleted and our emotions are so raw as well. And so for me, that's, I, I've, I've found that really tough. And um, for you know, all of us, as we're having those conversations, um, I think um, it's, it's hard to, you thought COVID-19 was the big challenge of the year, and then actually we've got one of this, these most significant moments. And that's been really hard, but then when I think I think back to other tough times in life. Um, and I think back to, you know, whether it's um, a broken engagement, um, whether it's- Which is part of your experience. Which is part of my story, yeah. Um, whether it's family and friends being diagnosed with, uh, with cancer and other illnesses. Which is also part of your story. <laughs> whether it's being um, deeply betrayed um, and deceived by um, people I'm close to, which is also part of my story. Um, when I look back at those moments, I'm encouraged in this tough time because I remember that God brought fruit out of those times. Mm. And I think it's Priscilla Shire who says that uh, faith is acting like God is telling the truth. And I'm just holding on to that at the moment, that, that God is telling the truth. And when we talk about, you know, heroes of the faith and being encouraged in faith, God is telling the truth. And I, I look back to those moments in the past when I've, been in pain, um, moments in the past where I've cried myself to sleep. And I remember that those are the moments, like David in the Psalms, I felt closest to God. They're probably the moments where are most memorable for me in that they have formed my faith, they've formed my character mm. in ways that good times haven't. Mm. And so like we were saying before, it's in, it's in the tough times that the heroes rise up. and. And it's because of those moments. And 
I just think that's really encouraging because if God is telling the truth, then also in this season, um, real fruit will come of it, fruit from our, uh, in our character, in our life, in our faith. And, you know, Isaiah 61, which we hold on to tightly, but if he's telling the truth, joy really does come. You know, we, our mourning does get replaced by joy. If we lean into him, we lean into mm -hmm. discomfort. I think you said before, we, we, don't, we don't often like to lean into the pain and lean into the discomfort, but there is, there's gold in there because mm -hmm. um, God is at work in that also. He, Jesus suffered. And it's something we've talked about as a staff team over recent weeks that we kind of ignore the pain sometimes, but actually sometimes we need to go through that with God hand in hand to, to have that fruit formed and be refined by the fire as it were. And Isaiah 54, you know, that is our, our verses for this year, you know, out of the barrenness comes the enlargement and that doesn't make sense. And, you know, we'll be looking at that over this series, won't we? That, that how out of the tough times fruit will come from that supernatural fruit when we lean into God. And, and you know, the, the joy thing, again, that next week um, we're talking about joy uh, in, in tough seasons and Lauren's bringing that, which I just, I couldn't think of a better person than Lauren to bring a talk on joy and share how to have joy in tough seasons because she so carries that. Jeez. And so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and if, if God is telling the truth, then, you know, if that's faith and God is telling the truth in Jeremiah 17, it talks about us never ceasing to you know, have a, a yield and fruit even in those tough times. And, and so I hold on to that, that even in this season of, of COVID-19, this season of uh, the, the fallout from the murder of George Floyd and um, years and years and years of uh, systemic racism, that even out of that, out of this moment, um, fruit can come and God is at work is it just lifts my faith, I think. Mm. And to be spending the next six weeks looking at how that happens and being encouraged and being given tools and stories of how to develop that in our own lives um, is an incredible thing that even in this moment, fruit will come. Mm. I think that's great, Jodie, and really helpful. I think I've been aware over this last season of, um, like you said, the, um, it feels like we've had a layer ripped off our emotional resilience. And so it feels like, um, like our emotions are all over the place. And I felt a way greater need to manage my pace and to take intentional care of my levels of emotional well-being and to, to be in touch with that. And I think one of the reasons that we felt like for running with the, the Giants, we should pick people who've been through hard times and their lives were actually representatives of God bringing fruit out of hard times was because for many of us, it is a season where we need to lean into Jesus and we need to lean into Jesus with our weaknesses mm -hmm. and with our pain and with our vulnerability because Jesus is there and can bring something beautiful out of it, but we need to lean into him with it. And one of the things that struck me as I prepared a lot of the material for it, which, which is, is what I've done, is, is the heroes actually are incredibly flawed and I think quite often when we use the word hero, we think superhero, you know, and we get out our Marvel films or whatever else. Stuart loves a good Marvel film, yeah. but um, <laughs> we, whereas I've seen about two of them. Um, but um, we love our kind of our heroes that have it all together and we have that in our minds. But actually, when you look at the people that we're going to look at, um, like, like Abraham and Sarah messed it up so many times and yet still they journeyed to the point that they saw the answer to their prayer. And uh, Samson's another one of our heroes, massive potential in God, but such brokenness and such, such failure. Jacob is such a, such a, a, a twisted story in, in many ways. And I find that really helpful because it's in the moments of understanding my brokenness mm -hmm. and my pain and sometimes my failure. I, I think we're not very good at One of the reasons I wanted us to do this as a conversation is I think it's easy to be a face on a TV screen and then for everyone to think, you know, the lights are good, the camera's good, your life must be great because you're sitting on this stool above everyone else's. But the reality is, is you know, um, it happens. Yeah. It happens and it happens to everyone. Um, I'm avoiding using the word. Um, but it, it, unpleasant stuff happens for everyone and everyone's got a backstory. And I'm so um, uh, committed to, so desperate to see a church that is actually able to be vulnerable and honest and real and stand with one another in that 
even and in our points of failure and weakness to there encounter Jesus because that's where we find the truth come and the fruit come and God's faithfulness be worked out. And we are, we're going to look at six heroes over, over the following weeks. There'll be different people speaking different weeks. Um, I think it's going to be really helpful. But I have been struck by the fact that at the start of the year, God gave us Isaiah 54, which is about fruitfulness out of barrenness because Israel was in exile at the time then in Babylon. So it wasn't a time that looked in any way fruitful. And there's uh, verses 11 and 12 in that passage, if you read on beyond the bits that we spoke before, it talks about God um, bringing out precious jewels and laying jewels as the foundations and jewels as the walls of what he's building. And I have in my mind and my heart the sense that God wants to remind us that we're all precious jewels Mm -hmm and that he wants to unlock something of our preciousness and our beauty in this season. And that actually what will mark us out from other people is the way that in the pressure, God is able to form and fashion something that's beautiful. We we probably could talk for ages, um, as you know, because we do it most Sundays, Um, but I'm I'm not going to let us do it this week. I'm still laughing at the fact that the technical team Um, made the two of us that preach with our hands and move with our feet sit and hold something (laughs) and not move for a morning Um, but even then God can work out of that Um, and I want to take a moment for us all together I, I, I think what I have in my mind is that today is an opportunity maybe for us all just to stop and breathe and maybe in our hearts and in our spirits just acknowledge that it's been a tough season, but welcome the presence of God into that because God is able to bring real beauty out of brokenness and hardship. And so wherever you are at the moment, maybe you want to put down your iPad. And I see there's some great celebrating of one another this morning. And I love that. I want to be a church who celebrates one another. I think as a society, we're not very good at that. We often tear people down. I think it's great to have time to celebrate the heroes in our midst and speak out the good and the positive over us. But why don't we put down the things that might distract us? Why don't we close our eyes? And why don't we just sit? And I feel like some of us, we just need to exhale. We just need to breathe out and kind of let some of it go. The picture I have is that for some of us, it's like like we've been wearing a corset, like we've been trying to hold it all in just to survive. And God is saying, just let it go now in my presence. Just breathe out the stress. Just breathe out the pressure. And as you breathe it out and exhale, then there's the opportunity to take a deep breath of my spirit and to breathe in my love again, to breathe in my healing again, to breathe in my restoration again. And just where you are, uh, whether you're sitting, whether you're standing, just breathe out a few times and kind of let the toxic go, let the toxins go, let the pressure go, let the pain go, let the stress go. And then as you let that go, just take a couple of deep breaths and breathe in God's love, breathe in God's goodness, breathe in God's healing, breathe in God's restoration. I'm just going to pray. Father, thank you that the truth is that you never let go. And whatever the season, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, you do not change. You are the same yesterday, today and forever. You are the alpha and the omega. You're the beginning and the end. And you're there right the way through the journey, right in the very middle. Thank you that you're there in every uh, mountain high. You're there in every valley low. And Lord, I pray right now that you will wrap your arms around each and every one of us. And Lord, where we've been trying to hold it all together, Lord, we just want to let go of trying to do it ourselves. And we want to surrender afresh to you and say, we can't do it without you, Lord. We need you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to bring to you our tears. We want to bring to you our loneliness. We want to bring to you our vulnerability. Thank you that you know. 
And thank you, you draw close. Thank you that you're closer to the broken hearted. And I pray that you'll breathe on us afresh with your love, with your healing, with your restoration. And I pray that in this season, I pray over this summer season, you will bring healing and you will bring some of that beauty. Lord, I pray as we look back, Lord, next year, um, maybe even in two months' time, Lord, maybe in five years' time, Lord, we will look back and we'll see how you did amazing things through this season because you are a God who turns uh, ashes into beauty, who turns a brokenness into wonderful healing, who turns pain into joy and celebration and dancing. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit will water us and bring beauty out of the seeds that you're sowing in this season to the honour and the glory of Jesus.